down with the Patriot Act, up with Periscope, and you might have already ogled your last RSA booth, babe. Tech News Tonight is next. It's time for Twit's annual audience survey, and we want to hear from you. Please visit twit.tv slash survey and let us know what you think. It only takes a few minutes, and your anonymous feedback will help us make Twit even better. We thank you so much for your continued support. Twit.tv slash survey. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 303 for Thursday, March 26th. 2015. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by MeUndies. MeUndies is the most comfortable and hip underwear you'll ever wear. Check out all the styles and get 20% off your first order, plus free shipping, at MeUndies.com slash twit. Welcome, I am Megan Maroney. Let's get right to the news. Two members of the U.S. House of Representatives introduced a bill yesterday aimed at abolishing the Patriot Act. And today, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and others submitted a letter to the Obama administration calling for an end to the NSA's large-scale data collection. Joining us to talk about this story and a few others is the Register's Ian Thompson with his arsenal of colorful language. Welcome back, Ian. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. So the Patriot Act was a bill passed by George Bush after 9-11. For those of us who need a little primer, can you give us a quick and dirty description of what the Patriot Act, Patriot Act was or is? Well, well, I mean, in the in the basically the in the panicky days after September the 11th, this I think it's about two or two and a half thousand page uh, act was uh, put together in a remarkably short period of time. Uh, went through Congress. It was introduced, I think, on October 23rd, 2001, and was signed off three days later after being swept through Congress and, and signed off originally. And it's this that has really been the legal basis uh, for much of the bulk data surveillance which has been carried out uh, by the NSA and others uh, within the US, and the, along with the Feast Amendments Act of 2008. So, so what happened yesterday? Who who brought this? Who who wants this to change? Who wants this down? Besides everyone. Well, it's it's basically a, the, we, there have been a number of bills aimed at sort of reining in certain aspects of it. There was the USA Freedom Act, which got shot down. Diane Feinstein's got her own her own view, with her own her own legislation in the pipe, which would basically legalize much of the uh, mass surveillance going on. But two senators, uh, one Democrat, one sorry, two congressmen, uh, members of the House of Representatives, one Democrat, one Republican. Um, introduced a new bill which would abolish the Patriot Act, abolish the 2008 FISA Amendments Act, uh, which is basic, would basically cut all legal uh, support away from uh, mass surveillance in this area. And interestingly, they also wanted to tag a couple of other things in there, which was protection for whistleblowers, not just within the security agencies themselves, but also contractors because uh, Snowden was a contractor and wasn't covered under existing whistleblower legislation. And also to have an independent controller to monitor the intelligence agencies and just make sure they're complying with the law. So they've introduced this bill to the House. It is a bipartisan bill. Uh, I have to say, from calling around a number of people, it hasn't got a snowball snowball's chance in hell of getting through Congress. But uh, it's nice to have it out there, at least. Yeah, I, I, I there's these big companies that came out today, Microsoft, Google, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Dropbox, I mean, a bunch of them, uh, they have a coalition called the Global Government Surveillance, Surveillance Reform Coalition. They're not new, but uh, they were kind of making news today uh, about backing the, you know, against the Patriot Act also. What was the news Indeed. today that they were making? Well, basically, uh, a part of the Patriot Act, which allows, for example, mass collection of mobile phone metadata of American citizens, uh, that's authorized under Section 215 of the Patriot Act. Now, that expires on May 31st this year, and Congress actually has to vote to reauthorize it. Now, what the tech companies and the privacy groups that they're associated with have been saying is don't. Just don't reauthorize it. Let it lapse. The time has now, you know, it's not going to harm national security significantly. Uh, there's still the executive orders which allow surveillance of, of targeted individuals. Uh, but bulk surveillance is hurting America, it's hurting the technology industry, and ultimately it hurts our privacy. That's their argument. And so they're 
push it. They've sent, sent this open letter both to the president, to congressional leaders, and also to the head of the NSA and the head of the DOJ, asking them to let it lapse, or if it must be renewed, then to introduce some serious safeguards to make sure that this is being done in a legal, decent and honest way. So what do you think that to let it lapse, do you think that has like a snowball's chance in San Francisco, maybe? <laughs> oh, with the weather today, probably not. But no, no, I don't know. I mean, I think the Obama administration from the read I'm getting from speaking to various people is that they might be willing to let it lapse um, simply because that would be a nice non-threatening or non-interventionist way to get this to get this thing uh, off the off the statute books, um, Congress has shown the ability to move when it wants to. Um, it all depends on what kind of lobbying muscle um, you're going to see. I mean, at the end of the day, if it does lapse, there are other sections of the Patriot Act which can be used uh, to enable bulk bulk data collection. But it would be a significant step forward in terms of reining back in some of the. Uh, really quite extreme measures which were put in in the, in the wake of September the 11th. Right. So let's move on to another story that you wrote today. You covered Amazon's announcement that they you no longer have to be an Amazon Prime member to use their cloud storage service. Uh, for $12 a year, you can store an unlimited amount of photos. That's $12 a year, right? Not $12 a month. No, no, $12 a year. And they actually said an infinite number of photos, which kind of makes you think that somebody at Amazon doesn't exploit, doesn't know the rules of physics. <laughs> an infinite number of photos would just be <laughs> so huge that uh, you really have to wonder what they were thinking on that one. I think the marketing department got in there and weren't quite thinking that one through. Um, so, yes, $12 will give you unlimited photos, but $60 a year will give you absolutely unlimited data. So as much stuff as you want to push into their cloud storage system, that you, you can get that for 60 bucks a year. Well, that doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, but already Prime, as a Prime user, you already get the infinite amount of photos. So obviously they know that works to some extent. Uh, how, how are they doing that? What are the limits? Well, <clears throat> storage is actually quite cheap. Um, it all depends on, on the details, and Amazon are being quite cagey about this. Amazon has Amazon Web Services, which is by far the largest cloud company. So they have an enormous number of data centers around there and very high, with very high levels of connectivity. So, in fact, storing the stuff, because not everyone is going to dump massive and massive amounts of archives of stuff on online. You can't upload files more than two gigabytes in, in size, for example. So no one's going to be storing HD movies up there. But... I think it's really, a, Amazon is making the play that cloud storage should be a lost leader in a way. Um, people will store their stuff with Amazon, therefore they're more, li more likely to use Amazon web services, they're more likely to buy from Amazon, and they're more likely to stick, stick stuff that they bought from Amazon onto these cloud servers. So it's, I think they're treating this as a lost leader because they really have slashed the prices that people would normally pay. If you look at iCloud, for example, to get just a terabyte of storage, you're looking at $240 a, a year. So offering that for 60 is a huge poke in the eye for Cupertino. And I'm pretty sure that Google, Google aren't going to be too pleased about it either. Right. But, it's you know, if you're using iCloud, then it's, it's so easy because it's built in. It's really, I mean, Apple kind of makes it a little bit harder to use any of the other cloud services. Oh, um, indeed. Um, Jennifer Lawrence, unfortunately, found that out to, to, her, uh, to her, her great disadvantage, but well, she handled it beautifully. That's a, my next question. What about security on Amazon? I mean, do you, do you know anything about that? This was the very first question I asked them was, what are you actually doing to secure this? And what are you doing to make sure that stuff that shouldn't go up there does? Presumably, they'd have to have some kind of automated scanning system. But I mean, basically, the, the way you'd upload this is to use an app on your computer or mobile phone. And the security of apps, there is no such thing as a 100% secure app. Uh, I would very much like to see what Amazon is doing on the security side of this, but they are being a little tight-lipped about it, which is a tad annoying for some of us who care about these things. <laughs> right, and we should all care about these things. <laughs> when you're putting your life up online, yes, mm -hmm. you really should, because, you know, it's an enormous amount of data there. Um, and I'd also like to see some kind of guarantees as to how it's going to be used and whether it can be encrypted, because Amazon has very close ties with the U.S. government and we're back to the Patriot Act again. So, um, yes, that could be interesting. But, I mean, on the whole, it's a, for, you and, for you and I, who you know, it, it's a cheaper way to put stuff in cloud storage. Um, that said, you can buy a terabyte hard, hard drive very cheaply these days, and it might just be an idea to keep your backups yourself. Right.
Good point. So now here's a story that I, I know you were confirming at some point today, but you had some sources reporting that language was added to the contract for RSA exhibitors saying that all staff had to be dressed in business or business casual attire for the conference. Essentially, it sounds like they're banning booth babes. Is that what you And reading? booth himbos, yes. <laughs> It's, um, that was I mean, my question. I haven't been to a conference. Are there a lot of male booths? They're, they're called booths? Not a lot. I mean, tech conferences tend to be sausage fests anyway. So, mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're, they're going for their demographic here. If you go to conferences which are predominantly attended to by women, then there certainly are. Um, and at CES, there tends to be a mixture of both. I've got to say, RSA isn't the worst for booth babes. Um, if, you want to, if you want really bad stuff, then go to some of the gaming conferences, for example. It's really quite shameless there. Um, but I really have to applaud RSA for doing this because not only is it distraction, but it's also really rather insulting, not only to the women who are uh, basically hired to do this, but also you're saying to people, I think if I put a scantily clad woman in front of my stand, then you're going to be such a horny mental incompetent that you're going to come here and listen to what I say and buy my product purely on the basis of, a, uh, of someone looking good. And that's not really what you're looking for, if, particularly if you're dealing with a computer security conference. I would hate to have my security buying decisions being made by somebody thinking with the wrong head. Right. But I, I've been thinking about this a lot today since uh, you sent this to me. And it's weird that they chose to go at it this way through the clothing. Because what, say like I'm a genius uh, engineer, um, I'm part of the the conference, I was there, I'm, I'm highly intelligent, let's assume that, and I want to wear a bikini. Shouldn't I be allowed to? Um, well, the, the RSA rules are actually what it, uh, are only for people who are on the stand rather than attendees. So uh, if you're an attendee, you could turn up in a, I don't know, a, a jockstrap or a bikini or whatever, and okay. then you wouldn't be barred. Um, I think that it's more about maintaining a respectful attitude. I mean, the, particularly in light of, thing, uh, of those idiots at Gamergate and that sort of thing, people are becoming a lot more aware of gender issues um, within the tech industry in particular. And I think it is a, good, a very positive step. Um, I don't think that, you know, obviously attendees, I think, can wear whatever they like. And obviously it's up to everyone to do the job that they want to do. But it really is, A, it's a distraction. B, it's rather insulting to... Uh, the whole booth babe and himbo thing. Um, and I, I don't really think it adds anything. You know, I mean, it's it, there are various techniques that people use to get, you know, to get you to come to their stand. But you've got to ask yourself, if somebody is having to use a gimmick to get you to come to their stand rather than their actual products, how good are their products? Right. Good point. Well, I applaud the RSA. I, I think your point is exactly right. That makes more sense that attendees can wear whatever they want. I will not be attending RSA in a bikini or in regular <laughs> business attire, but... <laughs> uh, no, I'm probably going in t-shirt and jeans as usual, but, you know, it's, it's it's the kind of thing. It's You can wear what you like there and, and people are there to listen to brains rather than look at bodies. Right. That's the hope, at least. Well, hopefully other conferences will pick this up, too. Thank you, Ian. Ian Thompson writes for The Register. It's always a pleasure to have you. Do you have anything coming up that you can tell us about that you're working on? Uh, I have a, a rather big story coming up, which I'm going to need another, maybe another week on, that the Americans might have beaten the Russians into space, albeit inadvertently. Um, but more on that as it comes in. Well, thank you, Ian. Take care. And you too. Pleasure as always, Megan. Thanks. And coming up, there's porn on Periscope and a stylish vest for your pooch that you control with your smartphone. But first, you need to know about MeUndies.com. We spend 90% of our lives in our underwear. With MeUndies, you'll get great fitting underwear that's two times softer than cotton. MeUndies are comfortable and stylish. Check out the photos yourself at MeUndies.com slash twit. This level of quality would typically retail for two times the MeUndies price. No retail middlemen or middle women means you save more. Because who wants a middle man or a middle woman in their underwear? Having comfortable underwear will change the way you feel every day. Once you try MeUndies, you'll never go back. Get yourself some good underwear. Go to MeUndies.com slash twit. Get 20% off and free shipping on your first order. Save even more when you buy a pack. That's 20% off when you go to MeUndies.com. They guarantee you'll be happy or your first pair is free. You do not need to send them back. They don't want them. We thank MeUndies for their support of Tech News Tonight. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. Twitter's live streaming app Periscope launched this morning and shortly afterwards, the world ended. Not really, but the world as we knew it ended. Periscope is Twitter's answer to the popular streaming app Meerkat.
Twitter lets anyone press one button on your smartphone and suddenly your video is streaming to everyone else on Periscope or anyone else on the internet who has the link. Now, the difference between Periscope and Meerkat is that Periscope saves the video so it follows you around forever with your digital footprint, just like all the other stuff that you've done on social media. The first few times I tried Periscope this morning, it was a little bit buggy. I got this message that said, the world is quiet now. No one is broadcasting. And that made me think of that old question. If a tree falls in the woods and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Now, if we see someone, if we can't see someone periscoping themselves, making a sandwich or buying eggs or walking the dog or driving home, did it really happen? Now, I did see live footage of the fire after the explosion today in New York City, and I saw it on Periscope before I saw it on the news. But mostly what I could see was a video of a bunch of people standing around recording the fire on their smartphones. Owen Williams of The Next Web reports that there's already porn on Periscope, although I didn't see any. Granted, I did not click on any Periscope streams that were labeled with titles like taking a shower or going to the bathroom. We previously passed on rumors that the new Beat streaming music service would cost $7.99 a month, $2 less than other st standard streaming services. Today, Fortune reports that Apple was unable to convince music labels to agree to their deal. Beats will offer a subscription service only, no free or ad-supported version, and it will be comparable to Pandora and Spotify at $9.99 per month. And the Android smartphone battle is heating up today, according to Engadget. The HTC One M9 goes on sale tonight, unlocked, or from AT&T and Sprint. And pre-orders for the brand new Metal Galaxy S6 start tomorrow. The official release date for the new Galaxy phone is April 10th. Move over Google Loon Balloons. The New York Times reports that Facebook wants to employ a fleet of solar-powered drones to beam Internet down to underserved areas. And finally, the most successful Kickstarter campaign of all times is about to wind down. You have about 24 hours left to back the newest Pebble project that already has raised almost $20 million. In case you haven't heard, Pebble Time and Pebble Steel are the new color e-paper smartwatches you can order by backing their Kickstarter campaign. And in case you're saving that space on your wrist for an Apple Watch, perhaps you would be better served backing Disco Dog, the new smartphone-controlled LED dog vest from Party New York City. The vest is fashionable and it keeps your dog warm and safe on night walks. It's festooned with 256 LED lights that you can control with your smartphone. You can make them sparkle or stripe or firefly or spell out a word of your choosing. I think all the small vests are gone, but if you have a larger dog, you can still get one. And that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. Write to us at TN2 at twit.tv and watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific. I recently asked you to post your selfies watching Tech News Tonight, and we have had a great response, but we're starting to run low, so send us more. Today's TN2 Selfie Fan of the Day is David Grant from Tucson, Arizona. He sent in this photo with the comments, me and my little Ready Players 1 and 2 love the show, particularly the family tech issues. Thank you, David. Send us more. Tag your pictures with hashtag TN2Selfie on Twitter, Google+, Instagram, or you can send them via email to tn2 at twit.tv. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and we will show your selfie on the show. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News, today, every weekday, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.